Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. We are going to discuss a study that was recently published by Publicis Commerce and Forrester Consulting. It's called Supercharge Your Customer Relationships, Connect CRM and Commerce for Maximum Impact. Marketers are increasingly expected to leverage different data sets to meet customer needs across the journey in a cohesive and holistic way. And the combined factor of higher customer acquisition costs and data deprecation due to the loss of cookies and other identifiers is making personal personalization an even bigger challenge. But the tactical challenges of bringing different data sets together and gleaning insights from them are very real. This is what recently the study recently commissioned by Publicis and Forrester dives deep into. And I am thrilled to be here today with Amy Lanzi, who is the CEO of Digitas North America and Ted Chadler, VP and Principal Analyst at Forrester, to dive into the key findings of the study so you can all walk away with a deeper understanding of how to connect CRM and commerce data to better serve your customers. So hi, Ted, Amy, thank hi. you so much for being here today. Um, before My we get pleasure. Started, yeah, before we dive into the research, I just want to um, Remind the audience that you can download the study yourself and sort of dive deeper into the key facts. Um, there is a box on the left hand side of your screen with a little uh, bar at the top that says handouts. If you click that, you can download the study right there. Um, so we encourage you to do so. Please do so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> please do so. We're, we're excited, right, Ted? So yeah, please do so. Check it out. We are. Yeah, you should definitely check it out. Yeah. Yeah, so um, let's talk a little bit about the inspiration behind the study. What sort of um, motivated you to, to dig into this? Amy, maybe you want to start. Sure, yes. So, you know, it's interesting as we think about commerce as a, you know, it's definitely having a moment. And one of the things that we were starting to have this hypothesis around is really how commerce and CRM really are working together. So if you think about the job to be done with our clients, it's how are we moving someone from the first purchase to being a loyal customer and, and what I call in my language a super fan of our brands. And so how does commerce and CRM work together? And so we were really trying to sort that from our side in terms of how our systems work and the role of data in that process or, or around how do we do that in a really efficient way. And we didn't really know what the answer was. This is a hypothesis. So we reached out to Ted and Forrester to, one, talk about that as a potential and get their perspective on it. Um, and so that, that was the intention is to really understand, like, what is happening in the landscape with key clients across different parts of the org and how we, you know, what we might learn from this research so we could start really guiding our consumers uh, and uh, our clients. And so, Ted, you know, I'll, you take it from there in terms of that was really what we came to you guys with in terms of getting this started. Yeah, no, definitely, Amy. And it's a hot topic for, I mean, I think it should have been a hot topic from the get-go, but it wasn't. And now now it is, which is, uh, I think, important. Something important um, just to kind of lay out quickly is that Forrester has Forrester Research and Forrester Consulting. And we keep that separation very much on purpose because Forrester Research is kind of what I am. I'm an analyst. I like to learn and listen, and we're serving you, who are on the call here, uh, to make sure that you're getting everything you need from technology to serve customers. We call it customer obsession at Forrester. Forrester Consulting gives us a chance to engage with our agency and, and provider clients to help them solve and answer questions that are burning issues for them. And as an analyst, that's great research. <laughs> so I love the chance to ask these probing questions and be part of research again, coming up with answers based on the data, based on the evidence. And so it's a wonderful opportunity that we have and that I have in this case to really think clearly and deeply based on the evidence of what happens when commerce and CRM and customer engagement actually do come together. Mm. For sure. Yeah. It is, it's such, oh, Amy, go on. No, no, go ahead, please. I was just going to say it is such a relevant topic right now, sort of as, you know, data deprecation and identity is becoming more important and everything is revolving around the customer journey, regardless of platforms and channels. Um, but at the same time, there's this explosion of commerce data, right? So how do you connect these things? How do you make them work? 
Um, I think it's something a lot of CMOs are grappling with right now. Yeah. They are. They're definitely <laughs> grappling with that. And, you know, we I think what's also interesting in this is just to brag a little bit about it is that we surveyed 673 decision makers at a director level or higher in marketing, CX, IT and in CRM in both North America and Europe. I offer that because we our hypothesis and we'll talk more about it as we get into it, is that sometimes the clients are very focused on the part of the org they're in. So you might be an e-commerce leader, you might be a CRM leader, you might be a brand owner, you might be a media leader. And they're coming in focused on what is their specific KPI. And, and often that KPI isn't necessarily getting consumers to fall in love with us, which is really what we want to do um, over time with our consumers. So we wanted to really cast a wide net here so that we could get a different perspective to understand like what is why are these two worlds not naturally converged it seems so obvious to to ted and i when we talked about this so you know what are the reasons that this may not be as clear as it is to us in terms of you know everyone's vision of trying to really deliver personalization at scale as well as these really loyal these incredible experiences that create loyalty yeah you know it's interesting um bringing the forester research kind of context here we have found uh, separately from this study, but we have found in our work in analyzing um, customer impact, uh, the critical importance of alignment. So um, we didn't actually uh, talk about this earlier, uh, Eamon Allison, but we have a, a study we do and did that looks at strong alignment between uh, CX marketing and digital. Digital is a proxy for, for commerce and uh, um, respondents. So it was a study of about 1,500 respondents, companies, um, that have high alignment amongst those three groups are 2.4, they grow 2.4 times faster, right? Almost two and a half times faster than those that have minimal or no alignment across those groups. So the alignment kind of reality, I'm sure you're all feeling out there, uh, you know, watching us um, is, really at the heart of the challenge. And, and what I think in this study, we had the opportunity to go really explore and get some nuance around it that leads to some action, some things you can do. So that, that um, hypothesis proved to be very, very true, <laughs> that we have separation and it's causing, um, it's causing a challenge that we can overcome. Yeah, I think you hear the word silos a lot. And I think that's definitely a major theme of, um, of um, the study. So let's let's dive into it if you guys are ready to um, start talking yes. about some of the key facts. And just before we do that, I just want to let the audience know that you can also um, ask a question in the in the same box where you'll find the handouts. You can under the Q&A tab, ask a question and we'll leave some time at the end to get to some of your questions. Um, OK, but for now, we're going to plant some facts from the survey for our listeners. So what for you were some of the, the main findings and key takeaways from the research? Um, Amy, why don't, why don't you kick it off? Sure. I, one of the biggest things that I think we anticipating, anticipated, but I didn't see it coming in this precise of a finding, is that our clients, our, our clients or you know, brand owners are swimming in tons of data across different places. But they're having a really hard time translating both CRM and commerce data into actionable insights for them to be able to really do something meaningful with that. So about 64% of the people we surveyed felt like this was a real challenge for them, that they're not really able to figure out what to do with all the data that they have. The um, and then challenge. to further that, yeah, go ahead, Ted. Yes. No, no, it was the number one challenge. It was the biggest one they identified, right? The ability to get yeah. value with that. Yeah. And so not only is it hard for them to get to insights, but then they also had this hard time about combining what they're getting from, you said the word earlier, siloed approaches around CRM and commerce to really uncover what they should be doing next, meaningful insights, as well as how to generate the next, the next best experience. And this was, you know, really at the heart of how we think about it. If you think about the worlds of paid 
Sheridan owned and how are you moving someone from paid the first time they make a purchase into owned? They love me. They love the brand so much. They are going to really come direct to my site site experience. These two things really need to work together because over time that becomes much more of an efficient way to spend dollars because you're spending time with and attention on someone that's going to come to you directly. So that was the big first big one that I think was really a key aha moment for us as we looked at the responses. And and I don't know, Ted, if you want to go into your next one that you like from this. Yeah, well, I mean, we, or if you sorry. have thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, look, I think the connection story, you're going to hear it again and again and again here. One of the questions that we asked, and I should mention Lane Abernathy was the key consultant uh, at Forrester on this and had some wonderful formulations uh, for questions. And one of them is, if you do these things, what will you get from them? So if you put the data together, what will you achieve? And um, very importantly, that almost everybody, 84% expect significant or transformational benefit overall to doing this connection. Now that benefit can come in many forms, and we'll talk about that a little later, but the benefit of doing this is so agreed, so high. So people know that they have an opportunity. And the question becomes, how do they execute against us? And that, that actually leads to, I think, a data point that I think is super important, which is kind of this gap between knowledge that, say, first party data in this case uh, is important, and then the ability or the um, actual utilization of first party data today. So first party data would be, CRM data would be the fact that you know somebody pretty well and you know a lot about them and you should be able to use that data to guide both your communications and your messaging for that matter and also their experience on their path to purchase on their next touch on their next engagement and so knowing it is great doing it to some degree maybe proving beneficial today and you smell the opportunity to do it way better and so that that closing that gap i think is one of the key actions that you would take out of this this piece of evidence which is that we have an opportunity we recognize that we're not taking advantage of today well that that's what set out to me that most marketers seem to know that there is an opportunity here but there's some sort of gap or or barrier happening where they they can't action on it so in your sort of opinion and, and based on this research what do you sort of see as some of those um hurdles well, there, there's lots of them, both uh, as evident in the study and, and more broadly in, in Forrester's research, one of which is that we've got, and you mentioned this early on, we've got all this data everywhere. It's sort of the chaos of data. And that happened in a very natural way, right? We built systems and touch points and capabilities to address specific needs as they arose. We've been doing this for how long now? 20 years in some cases. And so we've got all of these um, data systems to store data that grew naturally and organically. And because we had to, we had no choice. And now we see, oh, well, if those things could come together in some meaningful way, now we can act on this knowledge that is buried, this insight that's buried inside these core systems. So that showed up in the study. 95% of respondents report that firms face specific challenges collecting and storing data. And we'll come back to the collecting part in a few minutes, but the storing is, a proxy, again, a reflection of, of the fact that they don't even know where it is sometimes. <laughs> and so how are we going to shed light on that and, and bring it into the light of day? Yeah, or not even not know where it is, but what to do with it, right? I think a lot of times people collect data and then they, they think, okay, we have data, but it's really about the insights and the way you operationalize it, right? I mean, what uh, do you do I, with, yeah. with the data? Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I, you know, one of the key facts is that 84% of who we surveyed expect to see a significant or transformational benefit to connecting CRM and commerce data. So now they're collecting it, but then they're not creating system or, or orchestration around it, which is where we on the agency side tend to really see this happen in terms of the way briefs come to us, or when you start talking about the tech stack a client uses, that stack is probably, there's different stakeholders across the way that are making different decisions that then creates this like trap data, basically, yeah. and, and, it, and it, inability to connect it. So, you know, we love this idea of experience orchestration 
and how this is really the mechanism for a CEO to think about how they're driving their business is to really dig into customer experience orchestration for them and kind of overcoming some of the silos that exist within the, within the organizations. And one way to do that is through the system you're choosing and how it works together. And then the other is in terms of the KPIs that you're creating for your organization so that it's forcing everyone to be putting all of their amazing data as well as you know discrete technology they may have picked out so that it becomes something that's much more connected. Yeah. You know, there's some interesting things here that also are nuances that, that might be really helpful Amy, for us to explore around that utilization and that tapping of insight that showed up in the, um, the sector data. So when we ask about this, this sort of underutilization of first party data to generate insights and personalization, it varied a lot by industry. And so automotive was the highest, so like two thirds of automotive respondents, uh, industry respondents said they are utilizing data whereas only 39% of retailers said that. And so why is that? Well, you might wonder out loud that retailers don't know how to apply the data in their engagement moments because they're not practiced at it. They haven't thought about it. Their, their owner experience uh, awareness is not that um, uh, highly defined, except maybe in some key retail categories. In automotive, maybe it's a little bit um, more the opposite. Maybe there's more uh, ability to sort of find what insights are going to drive behaviors because you've been tracking somebody through your owned and, and uh, you know, sort of dealer networks, if you like, that allow you to do that. And so there's an interesting enablement and there's also an interesting sort of perceived permission, which I think was what you were implying a, a minute ago. Can we do this? Do we have, you know, the right or the, the privacy, you know, things get in the way? And I think one of the things for, for us to, to talk about is where, uh, you do uh, have permission because it, or it's anonymized or whatever, but also where you ha can ask for permission. <laughs> and that's now we're into the CRM conversation. It's like when somebody opts in with zero party data, they've given you permission to act on that, on that data because they know they're going to get a better experience as a result from that. So there's some things that come out of that where you, you don't want to just you know, say, well, we can't do that. That's not the right answer. The right answer is, I wonder what we can do if we were to tie these things together, if we were to create some synergistic connections between these data sets and these, these touches and these, these, these next moments of engagement. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I will say that I was surprised actually by the retail number being so low, mm -hmm. only because we're not talking about it really that much here because so many you know retail media networks are based on the strength of the retailers first party data. But it was really interesting to th see how they're using that as a way to grow a different side of their business, but not necessarily using in a way to grow their, grow their core business, yeah, which to Ted's point is how you are not only getting that first person to walk into the proverbial storefront digital or or physical or whatever it is but then actually creating a meaningful relationship with them by connecting these two things which so that was kind of amazing to me in particular that that was a response from the retail sector um auto you know makes sense to me more so because there's it's such a high considered purchase and it's a low velocity purchase so you really need yeah. to foster that and move someone from maybe thinking about it into making a purchase over time but they you know i don't know what the average purchase cycle is for cars but it's not like fast moving consumer goods at a retailer yeah, um right. so but yeah. I, there is there's a lot to do and and i love ted what you said around the value exchange so if if i feel like i have the permission to ask you to join in a relationship with me, it needs to be fantastic for me to continue that. You know, I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, I know I say this, that like my personal Gmail is like a separate job. There's so many things <laughs> in there that is crazy. <laughs> and at some point, you know, everyone goes to this moment of how they want to, you know, no longer have relationships and that's called unsubscribe right now. Yeah. And a lot of that is because you're not probably creating something that makes you feel that's helping me in some way versus trying to sell me more things. Yeah. We actually learned just one point during um, that actually after Black Friday is like a crazy unsubscribe day because yeah. people get such strange 
comms from different parties that they've already had a connection with that are don't make sense in terms of their previous buying behavior after Black Friday. So I think that's really interesting as like that's sort of the understated unsubscribe day, which I think feeds into this conversation here. Well, I mean, that permissioning thing I think is important. And if I put my, my customer advocacy hat on, which we do a lot at Forrester, we want that customer experience to be great in every dimension because the payoff is very high. It's payoff in loyalty, payoff in retention, payoff in um, higher commitment, payoff in happier ownership, which then leads to more referral. So there's three ways in which, which experience improves revenue. And that commitment is something that a CEO knows and very often execution uh, folks in various parts of, of the company don't necessarily have, um, they're not measured against it always. So it leads to these sub-optimizations. I, I gotta share this story. So my, my wife <laughs> thinks these are the ugliest shoes on the planet, but I love them. Um, and the color is kind of funky. And I saw some dude with his like cowboy cut, you know, boot cut jeans on wearing them. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get some of those. So I did and, and uh, I love them, honestly. Um, but then, of course, I needed a belt to match, and oh boy, what a what a what an opt out unsubscribe nightmare that turned out to be. It would have been a great opportunity, right? Oh, you just bought those shoes? Well, boy, you probably need a belt to match. Um, so uh, when we think about permission to do that, now we're actually into some harder uh, some harder conversations where I do I want us to spend some time later. Uh, thinking about, for example, the role that retailers play in that. But to, to tying those data systems together and, and having um, permission to use the data because you've made a commitment, a promise to somebody that when they opt in or when they share, they're going to get uh, a great experience. And I'll just do my rant for a moment, if you don't mind, Amy, which is that the direct-to-consumer brands, many of them started with that. They started with Absolutely. what at Forrester we're going to call the total commerce experience. And that sort of driver all the way through to a, a, an owner experience um, sets the bar pretty high in terms of customer expectations. And um, in some ways, that's a, a beacon, I think, for all of us to strive for. Yeah, well, absolutely. I think, I think, sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, I mean, the benchmarking on the digital native brands is really important. And they quickly get you to move from like to love to that, for the first like to the purchase to love. And I think a lot of that is also because so many of them are built on paid social. Now that's become mm -hmm. very expensive for these brands now. And we talked about customer acquisition and sort of just the complication of paid social, but it really did set the bar high, especially for the generate Gen Z, et cetera, depending on where you sit and which of the you know, different audiences you're trying to recruit, where there is just this immediate expectation that you know me as well as beauty brand X that I had my first mm -hmm. transaction to loyalty, you know, relationship with that, you know, everyone is expecting it to be that easy to buy a car, to buy a house. So I think it's a really important point, Ted, that it's like, how do we make sure that we're helping? I don't want to say legacy because I don't like that word, but more established no, brands figure out how they can behave in a way that some of these brands had the luxury to behave because they also don't necessarily have yeah. earnings and all these other things That's that right. sort of, you know, limit your, yeah. your ability to make some interesting marketing choices. Well, I think um, part of that like leads into the next part of the study we want to talk about, which is first party data, right? And sort of the the CRM piece of the of the equation, which is establishing a relationship with your customer where you have that one-to-one -one relationship and you can reach out to them in that in that context. Um, an interesting stat was that 87% of respondents agree that maximizing the value of first-party data is crucial, but only 53% report actually using it on a regular basis. So talk a little bit about the role first-party data plays in this equation and um, what maybe brands are struggling to um, how what's what's causing them to not be able to to leverage it in the way that they would like? I, I yeah, can start no, we, on this. Go ahead. Ted, go ahead. Go ahead. Amy. No, you go. So it's we see it first. I think the, that response I think was really interesting to see that because we've had a lot of you know uh, uh, some of our clients really have a nice handle on their core consumer. 
Um, but then again, they have the data, but then they don't know how to either continuously enrich that so they know more about myself or Ted. So there's one thing in like the first time I might have interacted. And then like that was my point on the, the unsubscribe day, that there's a lot of things that I've done that change me. But if your first party data feeding isn't as as um, up to date and fast, it doesn't feel real time, that becomes an issue. Because now if someone's especially opted in on a relationship and it seems like you didn't talk to me for a year, it feels very off. So that's just one that is a is more of a risk. Mm -hmm. And then the second is there is first party data that's coming into one part of an organization, but then it's not feeding into a system. So mm -hmm. they, you know, someone may know a lot about me, but it's actually not be being fed into something that then all moves from commerce to CRM or some other part of the organization or the marketing flow that I think is also one of the issues. So it might be sitting in a data COE and they know they need to collect it. So they've like gotten this, but then it hasn't been really fed into ways of working. So oftentimes when we're working with clients, we're working on how are we actually taking either seed data or what you have, enriching it, and then making that into how we operate from a marketing standpoint so we can continue to build your brands. Yeah. You know, Amy, one of the things that, uh, and I'm not su suggesting that we want everybody to behave like a digital native brand, that's not profitable. We'll all, we'll all run a business if that happens. The economy will tank. Um, but as you, you, you said, it's a, a, it's, it's a benchmark and, and, and maybe I think of it as an aspirational or a place to borrow some lessons from. One of the things I think that those brands have tended to do is think about what the customer experience and then really wants to be, what they want it to be, and then also what it really is. And listen and learn. So their listening ears are on at all times. And so to your point about kind of the cadence of engagement, you know, acting on the first party data you have, mining that data, knowing that that data is out there for one thing, so inventorying what you've got uh, and knowing it, and then having sort of an all in, very customer centric, view to how to utilize that information to provide a better, happier customer, which is where the CRM kicks in. So that cadence of communication would vary by category. If you're a multi-category provider, it would vary by the, um, the segment or the micro segment, if you like, the audience that you define. And so there are a lot of important signals in the data that are available, and particularly if you put them into the context of a communication strategy or a launch strategy or a re-engagement strategy. Uh, that is a meaningful one. And um, I don't think that's rocket science in the small. I think it's really hard to do in the large across all of your touch points and all of your, your capabilities and products. So one of the things I think that comes out in this study um, around utilization is kind of knowing where the data will have the biggest impact and stepping back from the immediate and asking where else can we use this data and how can we put it to best use? And I do think the technical systems are getting much better. I think the cost of putting the data in play has dropped dramatically. I think the ability to find insights in data, particularly now with ML, and we're all super excited about what, what the large language models are going to do for us. Um, but in point of fact, there's a lot of opportunity to at a pretty reasonable incremental cost, if you like, uh, find signals that will have a meaningful impact on on engagement and on communications and on on loyalty. So I think a lot of this is um, giving yourself permission to run some experiments against that by seeing where those uh, data have insights that you haven't yet tapped. Mm. Uh, one thing that stood out to me, in addition to maybe not knowing how to collect or flow in first party data, is that um, 38% of respondents cited a lack of access to retailer data or external partner data um, as a challenge in connecting these two pieces together. Talk a little bit about that and, and what the challenges are there. Sure, there's, so like we said earlier, data gets trapped depending on where it comes into an organization. So that's one thing. I think there's also, if you are a brand that is sold inside of a retailer, you are also that makes this pro, this make that makes this conversation much harder 
right? Yeah. Because if I am, I understand about what I've learned, I'm brand, I'm brand X, and I know a lot about how consumers behave with content I make, but then they go inside of retailer X and I lose my ability to stay with them. Right. Yeah. And so then all of a sudden it becomes somewhat of a black box. Like you don't know if they bought, you don't know what else they bought, you don't know what that engagement looked like. And this is where there's huge opportunity yeah. to learn more about how your brand is, you know, performing inside of a retailer ecosystem. And this is where something like a clean room that enables you to co-mingle in a privacy, you know, appropriate way, all of these yeah. this together so that you're not only building your brand inside of another ecosystem, but then you're also doing that in partnership with this retailer X, because now you're building the category. This yeah. then feeds into how you're then talking to them and bringing them back in again and again and again. So it naturally leads into a CRM system. So even some of our clients that always will sell their product or the 90% of their volume will come through a retailer, and these are manufactured products, they still want to have a relationship of their own, a direct relationship, and that's through content. It's not just through you're going to go to that brand.com and buy something. And so right. this is a really interesting place for to on two levels. One, it enables you to know more about that consumer in both your own world as well as in ecosystems you don't own. And then second, how you then are able to leverage that to build out your CRM relationship with them, which also equally benefits that retailer over time as well, which I think is a really interesting space that it's not only bring your own data, but it's also how are you using collaborations to grow because yeah. it's really hard to grow in, on your own in the marketing and in the, in the environment we're in today. Yeah, boy, I think that's such a important, um, comment you just made, Amy, um, the fact that there really has to be a mutual benefit and is a mutual benefit when a retailer works with uh, a brand to find those insights that lead to a deeper engagement and a better result for both parties. Uh, Jay Patasol and I have done um, a lot of work in the last few months, and we're about to publish this report. I mentioned the name of it a few minutes ago, the Total Commerce Experience. And in doing the research for that, we explored this topic, because uh, I also made the point that, it, where do I get the data? Well, if it's not my data, how do I bring it in in a way that I can learn from it? And that so that data integration is never going to be complete, right? You're never going to get all the data you want. But to have a clean room, a place where you can agree that there's going to be mutual benefit to looking at a data set in perhaps a single category and uh, you have to define it in a way that's simple and easy to get started with, but in a way that's mutual, mutually beneficial beneficial, where there's what we call that co-innovation, where there's a collaborative reason to work with a retailer if you're a brand or with a brand if you're a retailer, because there's benefit for everybody because you're serving the same customer and you're trying to have a happy, loyal customer. And so that, that integration of that alignment across um, the purchase process, if you like, is a big, big finding, uh, I think, in this study overall and uh, a critical enabler uh, here. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to boil the ocean to get started. You can start with a very specific high value place and see where it goes. And if, if it goes someplace meaningful, well then you'll, you'll be learning how to scale that, back to our scale question uh, over, over time. Are you finding, I'm curious if um, retailers, especially the big ones, are willing to share this data or if you know there are concerns that get in the way just historically how some of the bigger walled garden platforms have act, have been concerned about that in the past and how marketers looking to leverage this type of data can work with them it, it depends start? On the yeah sure it depends on the retailer some retailers you know want to do this because they know it's important to grow their business it also is framed very much as part of a commercial conversation. So it used to be, you know, if you were a manufactured brand, you would bring insights to that retailer about the category. Now the conversation is bring your own data and bring your media investment that might go into a retail media network if you're a manufactured brand. And if you're a retailer, you say, oh, excellent, I'm willing to do this, but you need to spend more in one of these places most likely retail media for that's my experience so far. So like that's a way to think about how you are bringing this into that commercial relationship. And one of the asks as a manufacturer brand is to say, fantastic, I want to be able to 
leverage that retailer's clean room or a clean room that they ha have already developed and owned their own relationship with. There's lots of models out there to then be able to see what happens. How do we grow the category? Did we drive incrementality? All of those really important things that are really important parts of conversations between a manufacturer brand and a retailer. I think it's really exciting versus something that, because it, it's, a, it's a data led way to figure out what we were already doing before. And then you can figure out different demand occasions, you know, other opportunities that really can grow your brand, your meat, like how your brand interacts with core consumers and also places for that retailer to play, um, which I think is a, is, a, is a fun outcome from this somewhat a little hard, but not too hard in terms of getting it done the first time on how you would really join voice forces in a clean room. Mm. Yeah. And, I mean, this showed up in the study as well, that one of the barriers um, or challenges is, is identity matching. And this is a place where, I mean, we're not going to be sharing identities. It's just probably not going to happen. But there's proxies for identity that can be enough. Uh, and there's certainly the ability to do cohort analyses that are quite meaningful um, as well. And so there's a, you know, with, 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 with Bye Bye Cookies, uh, we need to be more thoughtful about why we care about the individual. In the case of CRM, of course you do. You have to because it's an individual that you're serving. In the case of commerce, you want to translate that into a meaningful action and personalization that will, that will resonate. And so I, I, you know, I've been as an analyst, very, um, big believer that segmentation is not actually dead. It just has to get a lot more sophisticated in some sense. And that's probably not, that's probably a dirty word <laughs> out there. But in point of fact, if you don't have the identity perfectly matched, doesn't mean you don't have understanding what that signal, that intent signal is. And uh, you, you mentioned retail media as a big place where that happens. I also think it happens way, way up into now with um, brand marketing because we've got all this addressable media. So we can actually bring those signals of loyalty and of profitability. Lifetime value is one of the big um, care abouts in the study uh, all the way up into, in, into the very, very you know, beginning of the engagement model. And as a customer, well, that's great. I, they're, they're a customer already. I can bring them in at, a, at like you say, at the intent side when, 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 they're, when it's time for them to be thinking about it. But I, I, I do think we need to um, not get perfect matching in order to have actionable insights. I think we can we can be more thoughtful about that. Mm. Don't get perfection, let perfection get in the way of progress. <laughs> um, right. well, again, you can measure the impact. You can, the, the, the data signaling and the instrumentation of impact is good enough now that you can. And that's why the retailers are so interested in, in, um, in not just in retail media, but in clean rooms, because if they get um, a meaningful understanding, they'll harness it for their own purposes for sure. Uh, and the brand, of course, also cares because they get deeper knowledge of customers and what they need. Mm. So I want to uh, make sure we cover off on something we alluded to at the top of the discussion, which is silos and CRM and commerce teams operating separately. 83% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that CRM and commerce have historically operated as separate functions. Um, but for most organizations, CRM and commerce both live in marketing and they feel that they're kind of getting in their own way because of that. So what's some advice you have um, for teams to just start working more cohesively together and, um, you know, open up ways to share this information and data for the good of the brand? I, so you know, I'll, I'll go ahead, Ted. You, go ahead. You sure? I keep cutting yeah. you off. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. We were so excited to talk about this. It's great. Go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, alignment's obviously the key story, but I, I have to say that, you know, when Jay and I did this, this work on total commerce experience, it definitely, our knowledge of what to go ask about and learn, learn from is this evolved understanding, right? That, that came up in, in, in this, in this study. So thank you for that. Um, but when you think about it, the, the, the places where the, sh the shared care abouts happen is where the company has realized that the way they've been operating so far is not working, right? They, that they've sub-optimized the customer profitability and the lifetime value and the share of market um, because they've been optimizing something else. And CEOs are, are, they're woke on this. They know that they have to think and work uh, differently. So there really is a sea change 
probably uh, partly economically you know, driven of understanding that if we collaborate internally, let alone externally, uh, we'll get a better result for the company. And so um, I do think um, that that uh, agreement to work together starts with an agreement that we're pursuing something bigger than a single you know, conversion goal or, or loyalty count or, or something else, that we're really in pursuit of, of a happy customer that's more profitable. Yeah, I, I, 100%. I mean, one of the things that I think is important is looking for a significant emotional event at an organization that seems siloed so that you are able to galvanize around that one thing. So if it's a big brand launch, if it's a how do we go find uh, X segment? How do we recruit them into our brands? So now this is creating sort of a rallying cry that's up and around to Ted's mm. point, the next conversion or KPIs that are tasked to a CO, CRM leader versus a, a commerce leader versus a CMO versus a chief. I mean, everyone's got different KPIs and making it really simple. So it's like, how do we recruit in that one person to buy the one thing? and using that as the mantra to get everyone around a single goal and also bringing all of your your data, your technology, all those things to the center so that you're aligning on that single source of truth. This to me has been the biggest magical moment we've seen with our clients around how are we all aligning on, we're gonna focus on these three data points and this is where it all is what really starts to create the leaky bucket of a better customer experience is someone's like, oh, no, no, we did this over here and here's this data point. Oh, no, no, we did this over here and this is the data point. This is proof over here. And then who suffers from that is the customer. And so that's a really interesting way to think about it. And like, what is your net promoter score? What are the metrics you're looking at in terms of how, how consumers feel about your brand? How do they feel about your brand from an experience standpoint? That is really what the ultimate payoff it is um, for us as we think about these two worlds working together. Because if someone feels great about your brand, they're going to continue to buy the brand. And they're also going to have agency in your brand and become you know, a super fan and an influencer. And so I think that's also something to have this really higher order KPI that the CEO has to establish that then is something that everyone is really leaning in on that gets away from sort of the tactical planning that gets in the way of getting to those bigger yeah. areas that we all need to win in to be able to make brands grow. Yeah. Well, you, the study references customer lifetime value a lot as a, um, yeah. as a key metric. Amy, talk a little bit about that and why that's a good place to align. It's a great place to align because it's basically how you are understanding your most valuable customers over time. I mean, it's sort of in the KPI itself, but you would be surprised at how often that is not a KPI that a certain part of an org that were briefed right. by someone in marketing that's not worried about that because they don't feel it's attainable or it's not a KPI that is something is, that is in the next quarter that shows meaningful impact in the next quarter. But this yeah. is, as you think about the worlds of commerce and CRM converging, we're seeing it now, especially in retail media and how some of the retailers are thinking about converging their systems. It's much easier now to get to this than it ever was before. So it should be a quick North Star versus I drove the one more, you know, trans, uh, one more purchase of XYZ. That's not going to, because over time you continue to really pay to get that person. It's really expensive to get the one purchase. So the lifetime customer value component is the most important thing you should be doing. And you kind of can't afford not to do it now because if you don't yeah. get them now, you'll lose them or you may never be able to get them back in. Yeah. And, and that knowledge of what is a happy, uh, profitable, I call it profitable customer lifetime value um, is, is in the CRM data, right? It's in the customer mm -hmm. data, not the purchase data. And so one of the things I think might be an interesting analogy maybe that's not the right word like where have we been through this before maybe is one way to, to ask it we've been through it with commerce itself moving from sort of dot com managed separately as a channel separately from retail or from just distribution broadly think about what automotive has gone through in terms of engagement once we started to put the 
pieces together with a single purchase experience across all of the purchase touch points, um, which we most of us have done at this point, most retailers have done, most brands have, have done, there is, or at least have a plan to do, uh, there's payoff. There's payoff in terms of more efficiency, there's payoff in terms of higher um, engagement, there's, a, there's payoff in terms of um, faster time to completion. And so even just the fact that the retailers took a while to put Wi-Fi in their stores, but now they all have, and that meant it's done it a decade ago. There's a lesson learned there. There's a payoff that we experienced there that is essentially an analogy or a set of lessons learned that applies here as well. Because now we're branching beyond commerce, beyond purchase, out to engagement, out into ownership, into uh, acquisition in ways that are um, di directly analogous to what we learned there. So I think there's probably some signals, some building blocks, some metrics that we can borrow from and apply here to break down some of these perceived, I'll call them perceived barriers. Well, speaking of breaking down perceived barriers, there's, there's now that we've sort of gone through the key stats of the study, there's a lot here. There's a lot that brands and marketers need to do. Um, Ted, what are some quick ways they can sort of hack it while they're <laughs> waiting for, you know, some of the bigger organizational changes to take place? I, I love hacks, but of course, I should be thinking about the television show, not just the <laughs> coder use of the term. Okay. I don't want to be a hack. <laughs> um, so some quick things you can do. Uh, some that come to mind for me are um, you, you got to connect internally. So you got to reach across the aisle. You have to make that connection with your, your colleague. If you're in CRM, you need to be reaching out to somebody who's thinking about purchasing commerce just to find out what their care about are. And uh, you actually may have a lot more in common than you thought you did. And so I think a lot of times people get frightened, like, oh, we tried that once and it didn't work. But no, no, you gotta, you got to reach across the aisle. You can do that tomorrow. You can do that right now. You can do it this afternoon. Um, and that's always a good starting point. I've got a few others, but Amy, I'm sure you do too. Yeah, uh, I, it's specific to our space, you know, in the way we engage with clients, I think one big thing is rethink the way you're doing your briefs today. That's easy. So if you're typically briefing in and you're not including the head of CRM or however your organization is designed, do it. There, you know, it's not going to hurt you to do that. And also it'll illuminate where are the, the, the moments of well, I'm not sure we can do this or what are the hurdles that you can immediately overcome and you can kind of push yourselves to respond on that specific task in a combined way. That to me is, you know, we do that on our teams now and in, in, on our side because we have CRM experts, we have commerce experts. So, you know, we take, we take the briefs and reshape the brief. So it pushes our ability to really help clients think about the next place they should go. So I think on both sides, that's an important way if we we all know that this is something we have to get to and i would say equal to that is what is your step to get to uh cltv like how are you going to get there to be able to really meaningful point to that and what are the hurdles for it and you know can you create a quick play to be able to figure out how you can create your own hacks um to be able to solve for that within your organization yeah Ted, did you want to share some of your other? <laughs> well, no, I think uh, I, I do think you can ask for help. So I definitely ask for help. But I'm just going to maybe close my thought out by building on what Amy just said, which is that that for, take that first that it's that first moment, it's that first sort of thing that you get right and show, oh, that actually worked. Okay, good. We want to find we want to build on that success. And so don't overthink it. Just kind of wade in and, and find that first moment, that first touch, that first. Uh, opportunity you have to make that connection that will drive the the deeper the deeper engagement the better the better connection. Awesome. Well, just want to remind the audience one more time: if you have a question, now is your time to ask it. Um, and another quick reminder to download the study in the handouts tab if you haven't yet. It's super interesting. There's tons more in there that we could probably keep talking about um, for for another hour, but. Um, you know, for now, uh, I just like to thank you all so much for attending this webinar. Um, you know, definitely download the research. And then also, if you want to keep up with the latest on all things commerce, please follow Publis's Commerce on LinkedIn. Um, any final thoughts from our speakers? No, thank you.
Thank you, Ted. It Thank was fun. You. It was fun to do this and to talk about it and make it come to life. And I hope everyone downloads the research. It's great. I mean, we're predicting the future. We're calling it convergence. So would love to know your thoughts on that as you go through it. Let's leave it there. It was a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Great. Great. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>